to develop ourselves into a complete human being and eliminate our defects. Posted in Lectures by Samuel Aun Weir. Written by Samuel Aun Weir. We are going to talk a little tonight about the issues that most interest us and for which we are here. Brothers and sisters, certainly, the fundamental thing in life is to have reality. In the name of truth, I have to say that the humanoid is still incomplete. If we look at the lower species that inhabit the face of the earth, one-brained and two-brained animals, we can demonstrate, for ourselves, that they are born complete. A horse is complete, a cow gives milk and is born complete, but we are born incomplete. Our humanoid body is formed inside the maternal womb, there it is gestated and then it is born, it grows, it develops. Creative energy brings it into existence. In its development process inside the maternal womb, we see how the various organs are being formed, but at birth it is not yet complete, not even the newborn's frontal fontanelle is closed. What the people call here the crown or the crown of the head of the newborn is not closed. If we add to that its condition, we will see that the newborn is not complete. Certainly, and in the name of truth, and this is recognized by the professors of the medical university, the intellectual animal, they say, is a rational mammal. And it is true, it is not complete. The germ that developed in the maternal womb, by the fact of being born, does not mean that the creature has already been completed. The development of the creature continues, in its ordinary sense, as humanoid, until the age of 21. Now you will understand why it is really dangerous for an adolescent to have sexual intercourse. The adolescent has not completed his development and does not complete it until 21 years of age. The creative energy that brought it into existence, that energy that caused the conception of the fetus within the womb, that brought it to life, that same energy has to develop it, but only at the age of 21 has the adolescent reached full development as a humanoid. But that does not mean that, really, for this reason that total development is already complete. No. It has developed as a humanoid but not as a human. The human must still be made, the human must be created. We are humanoids, but not humans, the human must be formed within the humanoid like the butterfly within the chrysalis, in ancient times, all this was understood, all this was known. There is something very beautiful inside of us. I mean the consciousness, I mean the essence, what is called soul. Originally, the essence or the soul, or whatever you want to call it, came from the Milky Way, many years, millions of years ago. The essence of each of those present here came from the Milky Way, and in the Milky Way it will resonate with the harmony of the universe. Later, it passed to the solar system, and continuing through the planets of the system, it arrived here in the planet, then developed as a mineral, continued as a vegetable, continued as an animal and finally was incorporated into a humanoid organism. But the essence, unfortunately, due to our mistakes, got wrapped up in a series of undesirable elements. The undesirable elements within us. The essence is the consciousness, and it is wrapped or bottled up in an accumulation of undesirable elements. It is necessary to break those elements so that the essence awakens. An awakened essence, an awakened consciousness, has access to the superior worlds of eternity. An awakened consciousness can see, touch or taste the great realities of the world of the pure spirit. An awakened consciousness can control all the adverse circumstances of life. An awakened consciousness is never a victim of circumstances, it can direct them at will, it can originate new circumstances. But, for the consciousness to be awake, the undesirable elements that we carry within us must be destroyed. Those elements are anger, greed, 
lust, envy, pride, laziness, gluttony, etc. It is necessary to remove such elements and instead create something different. Those undesirable elements that we carry within us are a wrong creation, a false creation, and must be destroyed. Each one of us carries inside a false creation. We need to make a new creation within ourselves, and this is only possible by destroying our psychological defects, ending all those errors that we carry in the depths of ourselves. We need to finish those errors, eliminate those defects, and create something new within ourselves. It is possible to create something new, it is possible to create the superior existential bodies of the being. If each humanoid takes advantage of that creative energy that brought them into existence, that energy through which they were able to have a body of flesh and blood, if they reach the age of 21 and instead of squandering it they take advantage of that energy to create their superior existential bodies of the being, the essence would be clothed with those bodies, that would be a new creation. So, it is better to make a new creation than to continue with that old false creation that we all have within. The old creation that we carry within us, I repeat, is constituted by the psychic aggregates and these aggregates are our defects. We have countless flaws. As Virgil stated, No, not if I had a hundred mouths, a hundred tongues, and throats of brass, inspired with iron lungs, I could not half those my horrid crimes describe, nor half the punishments those crimes have met. The Aeneid. We need to eliminate such defects, such aggregates. Instead of those aggregates, which seem like a true swarm of demons in our psyche, in our interior, we should create, I repeat, the superior existential bodies of the being. These are created with the same energy with which our physical body was created, with the same energy with which it developed in the maternal womb, with the same energy that made it grow from a child to the age of 21. Such energy is called sexual energy, it is the energy of sex. So, in ancient times people were wiser. In Lemuria people lived from 12 to 15 centuries. There was, at that time, enough time for the essence to dress itself with the superior existential bodies of the being. The Lemurians, after the age of 21, instead of wasting their creative energy, they transmuted it, with that energy they created the superior existential bodies of the being. And if they took many centuries to get married, it didn't matter, because they lived from 12 to 15 centuries. So that, always, in the long run, they could afford to manufacture, through their sexual energy, the superior existential bodies of their being. Nowadays, life is very short. At the age of 21, youth properly begins. Before the age of 21, there is adolescence first, and second childhood. Unfortunately, adolescents already spend their sexual energy without having finished, or even, their development as humanoids. If adolescents, instead of squandering their sexual energy, saved it and, upon reaching 21 years of age, intelligently took advantage of it to create the superior existential bodies of the being, we would have a harvest of masters. Unfortunately, upon reaching adolescence, youth, waste of creative energy occurs, abuse of sex occurs, etc. Today we are in a hurry because we no longer live 12 to 15 centuries. Nowadays, it is necessary to create the superior existential bodies of the being before old age arrives, because if we reach old age and have not created those bodies, we will have to disincarnate having wasted our time, we will find ourselves in the inferior astral world, then, converted into something that has no value, since what is death? Death is a subtraction of fractions. When the hour of death arrives, what is it that continues in the beyond? The values. You know that if we subtract the fractions, that is what remains, the values. 
and death is a subtraction of fractions, and what continues are the values. But what values are those? Positive values. And negative values, the eyes of good and the eyes of evil, the eyes are defects, all of these are eyes. What is the ego then? A sum of eyes. And those eyes, what are they? They are undesirable subjective elements. Not all eyes are bad, there are good ones, but they don't know how to do good, they do good when it shouldn't be done, the eyes of good don't know how to do good. You know, for example, that the water in the sink is useful, you know very well that the fire in the kitchen is good. But if the water, for example, runs out of the sink and floods the house, it will be bad. If the fire comes out of the kitchen and burns the curtains in the living room, it will be bad. Thus, good is what is in its place, and bad is what is out of place. The good eyes that we have inside do not know how to do good, they do good when it should not be done. They don't know how to do it, and if they do, they do it wrong. That is why it is necessary to put an end to the eyes of good and to put an end to the eyes of evil, to wield the sword of cosmic justice, and to go beyond good and evil. Eliminate, I repeat, the wrong creation that we all carry inside, and to make a new creation. This is very indispensable. The superior bodies of the human being. How shall we make that new creation? Well, simply, by transmuting the creative sexual energy. Instead of walking around in lasciviousness, in fornications, take advantage of that energy that put our body into existence, that wonderful energy that made us grow, use it wisely, to create the superior existential bodies of the being. If we didn't do the work, if we didn't put an end to that mistaken creation that we have inside, all of those eyes, well, that bunch of devils is the only thing that will continue there, in eternity, after death. But if we create the superior existential bodies of the being and eliminate our psychological defects, we will receive the psychic and spiritual principles and we will become true humans, real humans. With the sexual energy, wonders can be done. If we transmute our sexual energy, with it we can create the astral body. You know that you have an astral body when you can use it, when you can travel with it. You know that you have an astral body when you can use it, like your hands or your feet. That astral body is subject to 24 laws, it is a marvelous organism. Rare are the people who are born with an astral body, since it is not a necessary implement for physical life, but one can create it, one can manufacture it. Whoever gives oneself this luxury, after death will find that one has a true astral personality, one will find that one is still alive in the region of the dead. One can also afford to create the mental body. Ordinary people do not have a mental body. Really, each psychological defect is personified by an eye. We have many eyes inside us and not just one, and each one of the eyes that we have has its own mind to think, so we have many minds. Those who speak, those who say that we have one mind, are wrong. We need to create an individual mind, and that is possible by transmuting sexual energy and eliminating, from our understanding, the multitude of eyes that we have. One knows that one possesses the body of objective reasoning or of the individual mind when one truly learns how to think in accordance with the data of our consciousness. The mental body is the body of objective reasoning. There are two types of reasoning, my dear brothers and sisters. The first is subjective reasoning. It is based on external sensory perceptions, with the data of the senses, one elaborates one's concepts and this is how it works, one cannot know anything about reality, about truth, about the being, about God, because one's reasoning processes are based on the data from the five senses and nothing else. That is why Mr. Immanuel Kant, 
the great philosopher of Königsberg in his critique of pure reasoning demonstrated that subjective reasoning, the common and ordinary reasoning that we all possess, could never know anything about the truth, about reality. But there is another reasoning that is well worth developing within us, I mean, clearly, objective reasoning. Objective reasoning is when you have a mental, individual body, and that mental body must be manufactured and it is manufactured with sexual energy through the transmutation of the creative sexual energy. Whoever possesses that mental body will have objective reasoning. The objective reasoning is based on the data of the consciousness. It works with the data provided by the consciousness. Humans of objective reasoning are the true sages, the enlightened ones. One knows that one possesses an individual mental body when one is capable of receiving divine wisdom directly, when one is capable of thinking without the need of the information from the five senses. Now, speaking about the will, what shall we say? Ordinary people do not have a defined will. Since we have an erroneous creation within us, defects personified by such and such eyes, obviously each one of those eyes, each one of those thinking demons that we carry within us possesses its own will. Thus, we have many wills, not just one will. We need to create the body of the cognizant will to be able to direct our actions. Whoever affords oneself the luxury of creating the body of the cognizant will will be able to create new circumstances, one will not be a victim of circumstances. We need to create that body, the causal body, as it is also called. Whoever has the luxury of creating it obviously becomes a master. A human with the physical, astral, mental, and causal bodies is a developed human. Animals are born complete, but the humanoid is born incomplete. It needs to be developed, completed, through cognizant work and voluntary suffering. One needs to transmute the creative sexual energy to create the astral, mental, and causal bodies and receive the psychic and spiritual principles. This is how one becomes a human. One needs to eliminate the wrong creation that one carries within, constituted by the pluralized eyes, multiplicity of demons, personifying errors and that every humanoid carries inside. Thus, we must develop the human being within ourselves. The human being must be created. We need the human's availability. Creating the human being is essential. The astral body has its laws. It is governed by 24 laws. The mental body is also a wonderful organism, governed by twelve laws, and the causal is governed by six laws. The astral body has its anatomy, its physiology, its biology. There is a secret procedure that allows the adept who disincarnates to continue living here, in the physical world, with the astral body. One can materialize that body and live physically, physically coexist with people for a year after death. It is a complete organism, it must also be nourished, and it is nourished when we learn to transform the diverse impressions of life, when we learn to transform them through a very simple key, which consists in learning to welcome the unpleasant manifestations of our fellow people. Whoever does this, with such transformed impressions, will be able to feed the astral body, so that it develops fully. I want you to have an astral body and to be able to function in all areas of the universe. With that body you can travel to any place on earth. With that body you can attend the Great White Lodge. I want you to have a mental body so that you learn to receive the knowledge of your own being directly, so that you no longer depend on the five physical senses, so that you can experience the truth. I want you to have a body of the cognizant will, so that you are not victims of circumstances, so that you can create new circumstances. There is a need to make a new creation within ourselves. It is essential to create the human being within ourselves, 
but it is also essential to eliminate the wrong creation that we carry within us, anger, greed, lust, envy, pride, laziness, gluttony. All these defects are personified by living demons. In ancient Egypt, such demons were called the red demons of Seth. So, then, we must put an end to those red demons to liberate the soul, to liberate the consciousness, and instead of that mistaken creation, manufacture the superior existential bodies of the being. You have to do the great work, but do it with love. After receiving this knowledge, we must share it with our fellow people, take the teaching to all corners of the world, found, everywhere, groups of people who are, in truth, willing to study the entire body of doctrine. The end of the cycle is near. It is necessary for you to understand that the sun is doing a great experiment. The sun wants to create solar humans. During Abraham's time, there were quite a few creations of solar humans. In the first eight centuries of Christianity, there were also quite a few solar humans who were created. In the Middle Ages, a few were created, but in this age, the creations have been very poor. The sun is doing an experiment, but since the creations have been very few, it is going to destroy this root race, and it is going to destroy it shortly, with a great cataclysm. It is good that you know that a root race does not last more than the duration of a sidereal year. Just as the earth has its year, which consists of the revolution of the earth around the sun in 365 days and some fractions, with minutes and seconds, so, there is also a sidereal year. And it is that our solar system, together with our earth, travels around the zodiacal belt. This trip is equivalent to about 25,968 years, that is the time that a root race lasts. Our root race began after the universal flood, then a journey began that began in the sign of the water carrier, but the journey is ending because the solar system returned, once again, to the sign of the water carrier, Aquarius. During the journey, the poles of the earth are deviating, and we already know that, at this time, the geographic pole does not coincide with the magnetic pole. At these instants, if an airplane travels towards the pole, directed by the magnetic needle, when it descends on what is considered exactly the pole, we will find that the pole is no longer in that place, because the magnetic pole no longer coincides with the geographic pole. The poles are drifting towards the equator. To this are due the changes in the climates, the alterations in the spring, the alterations in the summer, etc., and soon the axes of the earth will have been revolutionized. Add to this unusual event the arrival of the planet Hercolybus, like a gigantic monster comes to devour the earth. It is already in view of all the telescopes in the world, it belongs to a very distant solar system, which is called the Tylo system. Hercolybus is six times bigger than the planet Jupiter and will pass through an angle of our solar system. When this is the case, the revolution of the axis of the Earth will precipitate, and the fire of the volcanoes, attracted by the force of gravity of the planet Hercolybus, will set the world on fire, and the water will complete the tragedy, the seas will change their beds, and these lands on which we are living will remain at the bottom of the seas. Indeed, the journey is ending, there are only a few degrees left for the journey to come to an end. And it is good that you understand this, that the journey is coming to an end and that a root race does not last more than the sidereal year. Now, just as the earth has its four seasons, spring, summer, autumn, and winter, so also the sidereal year has four seasons, spring, the golden age, summer, the Silver Age, Autumn, the Copper Age, Winter, the Iron Age. At this moment, we are in the Iron Age, in winter, humanity has reached the height of perversity and human creations are few, there have been few successes in nature's test tube, 
people have lost all interest in the solar intelligence, and when people lose all interest in solar intelligence, the sun also loses interest in people and has the luxury of creating a new root race. For the experiment in the laboratory of the nature, the sun wants to create solar humans, but it is not possible to make that creation if we do not cooperate with the sun. Within us are the seed germs of the astral, mental, and causal bodies, which if developed, we become solar humans. But it is necessary that they develop. They cannot develop if we do not cooperate with the sun. We need to cooperate with the sun, my esteemed brothers and sisters, if we want the development of the superior existential bodies of the being. How to Eliminate Egos it is necessary to understand the need to cooperate, but I am going to specify, in a practical way, what I am saying. What are the eyes? They are psychological entities that live deep within ourselves. There are good ones, there are bad ones, there are useful ones, there are useless ones, but they are subjective and inhuman, our consciousness is bottled up within those eyes. We need to pulverize them, to reduce them to ashes, and that is possible if we are always in a state of alert perception, alert novelty. It is in the field of practical life where we must discover ourselves, because in relation to those around us, the defects that we carry hidden emerge and if we are alert, we see them. A discovered defect is a discovered eye, an eye that has a mind to think, that has a will, that has desires, it is a diabolic living entity that lives within us. If we set out to destroy it, we destroy it. The first thing that interests is to discover it, and then to disintegrate it. Observation is essential. Observe our own psychological defects and then judge them and finally disintegrate them. Spies, in war, are first observed, second are tried, and third are shot, this is what we have to do with egos. If a thought of anger assails us, it is an eye that we must first observe, then judge and thirdly disintegrate. Yet, it is not possible to disintegrate any psychological defect with the mind. The mind, by itself, can label any defect with any name it wants, pass it from one level to another, hide it from itself and from others, but not finish it, not annihilate it. It takes a power that is superior to the mind. Fortunately, that power exists. I want to refer emphatically to the power of the Kundalini. Through the Divine Mother Kundalini, we can pulverize any defect. Kundalini is Tenansin, Kundalini is Isis, Kundalini is Ramayo, Kundalini is also Diana the Huntress, likewise, she is Adonia, and she is Isobertha, and she is Rhea, and she is Sibylle, and she is Maria, a part of our own being, but a derivative. So, if we appeal to her, to that part of our own being, and we beg her from the bottom of our hearts to disintegrate the eye that we have understood, that we have comprehended, she will do so, she will pulverize it she will disintegrate it. And finally, with this procedure, we will be able to disintegrate, ending all the eyes that we have inside us, and one day, the essence will be free. Thus, it is necessary to eliminate this mistaken creation in order to make a new creation within us, to create the bodies of gold for the intimate Christ, to raise the temple of the Lord within ourselves, it is a temple of pure gold, and that temple will be formed by the superior existential bodies of the being, and those bodies will be formed by transmuting the creative energy. We will teach you all of this in our works, the whole Tantra. We will teach you how to transmute that powerful energy in order to create the superior existential bodies of the being. In my books, I have written what that science is. They're in the perfect matrimony, they're in the mystery of the golden flower, they're in the secret doctrine of Anahuac. 
In these books is the key to transmute the creative sexual energy and create, by means of it, the superior existential bodies of the being and become solar humans. Thus, eliminating the inhuman and creating the human within us is necessary, it cannot be postponed. Sacrifice for humanity is the third factor. Of course, if we truly love human beings, we will raise the torch high to show the way to others. Unfortunately, today, as we are, we are nothing but simply humanoids. The time has come to create the human, for a human to emerge, for a human to appear. People continue to believe they are humans, but a human is the king of creation. Which one of them can govern themselves? Behold, if we are not capable of governing ourselves, how could we govern the universe? And if the human is the king or queen of the universe, then wouldn't it be contradictory to say that all of us who inhabit the earth are humans? If that were true, we would all be kings and queens of creation, masters of the universe, and up to now we are not even masters of ourselves, we are victims of circumstances, victims of our own mistakes. There is a need to destroy that mistaken creation that we carry within us and make a new creation. It is beautiful to have an astral body, to explore all corners of the universe. It is beautiful to possess a mind that can function with the exclusive data of the consciousness. It is beautiful to possess a body of willpower that will allow an individual to govern all circumstances, to become master, but truly master of the universe. So ends my talk for tonight. But I am naturally willing to answer questions. Everyone, everyone can ask what they want in relation to the subject. Questions and answers. Student, I want to ask you, Master, the following, can a man of 70 or 80 years old create his solar bodies? Samuel and Weir, well, already at that time of life, things are serious, but he can afford to fight a lot for the disintegration of his ego, of his I, of his myself. And if he begins to work on himself, disintegrating all the errors that he carries within him, in a new existence his work will continue, he will be able to afford to create the superior existential bodies of the being. But first of all, it is necessary that you walk in this knowledge. It is not enough to study Gnosis, it is necessary that Gnosis reaches the consciousness, the being, because if Gnosis remains in the personality, nothing else, if it remains only in the exterior, in the intellect and does not pass into the consciousness, then, in the new existence, no agreement will be achieved regarding his longings, his desires for self-realization. But if one loves Gnosis, and if that Gnosis enters the consciousness, then in a new existence, well, he will really work for his self-realization. Any other brother or sister want to ask? Student, in this path of Gnosis, is it necessary to shed even one's own blood? Samuel and Weir, of course. We should not hesitate to shed our blood in the name of our Lord the Christ, because there is a need to destroy the eyes, I refer to killing the eyes, to break them, to reduce them to ashes. Do not forget that within each person there are many people, that each eye is a person, that each eye has the mind to think, the will to do, that there are many people who enter and leave our body, and who handle us, simply, as simple puppets nothing more. We are robots, controlled by those many people who live inside us. You have to destroy them. Does anyone else want to ask? Let's see. Sister. Student, there is a brother who entered Gnosis and already wants to leave. Why does this brother, who has so little time, already want to leave the teachings? Samuel and Weir, because he is degenerate. First, because he doesn't even use all of his brain to think anymore. Observe that, if in the middle of a great party, we put on a symphony of Beethoven, not one of the guests would remain, right? 
Nobody likes the music of the great masters anymore. For humanity to come to appreciate this music, it would be necessary to start by regenerating the brain. This root race is degenerate. In Lemurian times, one could live from 12 to 15 centuries because the human being was governed by another law, by another principle, which was the principle that governs the lives of humans, the Fulasnatamnian principle. But when humanity degenerated, because the ego developed, passions developed, vices developed, then the intellectual animal was governed by the law that governs animals, which is the Itoclanos principle. In sum, today we are no longer governed by the Fulasnatamian principle, which is that of humans, today we are governed by the same principle that governs horses and donkeys, which is the Itoclanos principle. One dies very soon, and life hardly lasts. In Atlantis, for example, people lived not as long as 12 or 15 centuries, but at least half. In Egypt, humanity had already degenerated so much that it could not live more than 140 years. In the Middle Age you could go over 100 years, 110, 120, now, in these times, people are dying between the ages of 50 and 65. So, people hardly live anymore, there is almost no time to manufacture the superior existential bodies of the being, they die without having manufactured those bodies and continue in the astral world, converted into a bunch of devils, without individuality, with nothing. So, we do not have a true reality, we need to create those bodies and put an end to our defects to become humans, but real humans. And what I am saying can be verified. If you learn to leave the physical body at will, you will be able to see the disembodied in the astral world. It is very easy to get out of the physical body. All you have to do is lie down with your head towards the north, relax your body well, pronounce the mantra Faraon, like this, Faraon, many times, but mentally, and fall asleep, fall asleep, and when you are already asleep and awake, gently getting up from bed, but always feeling identified with your being. Thus, if you do so, the body will stay in bed. And outside of the body, if it occurs to you to call a loved one, one who disincarnated, a loved one who died some time ago, you can do so, and you will see that this being comes in different figures, in different forms, because? Because within that person there were many people, and those many people are the ones who continue in the beyond. So, this is very easy to check for yourself, if you learn how to leave the physical body at will. Student, master, is it possible that today someone can live more than 100 years? Samalan Weir, today it is amazing that someone reaches 100 years, but, really, it is almost nothing that has lived. Let's think of Lemuria, where one lived from 12 to 15 centuries. So, this humanoid root race is degenerate because the essence remained inside the ego, the ego developed and the ego destroys the vital force, destroys the vital force and then the organism ages rapidly and dies. Our diseases are produced by the ego. Student, how can brain regeneration be achieved? Samalan Weir, well, regeneration is achieved by transmuting the creative sexual energy. The married will transmute it in the ninth sphere, following the path of the perfect matrimony. The singles will be able to transmute it through pranayama or they will be able to transmute it through the vajroli madra. There are different forms of sexual transmutation for singles. But, in any case, you have to transmute the creative energy, not waste it, not squander it. Now, the creation of the bodies is only possible through the Sahaja Methuna, that is, following the path of the perfect matrimony. Because the man represents the positive force, the father, the woman the negative force, the mother, and the Holy Spirit is the conciliatory force, the sexual force, that reconciles them both. 
Through this trinity, these three forces, not only a new human creature can be created, but a new body can also be created, this is obvious. The three forces make any creation, the positive force and the negative force and the neutral force can create. But if they are directed towards different places, there would be no creation. For a creation to arise, it is necessary that these three forces have an impact, meet at the same point, and then there is a creation. One, alone, can transmute all of his creative energy, but in that way one cannot create a new body either, but one can use that energy to fully regenerate his brain. If the path of the perfect matrimony is followed, not only will the brain be regenerated, but the superior existential bodies of the being will also be created, because one will work with the three forces. Is there any other question? Student, what can you tell us about modern music? Samuel Aoun Weir, well, current music is rather subhuman music. That music is related, then, with inferior emotions and with animal passions. But the sublime classical music of the masters can also help us to sublimate the creative sexual energy. Therefore, current music harms us seriously. The musicians of this time no longer know anything about the sacred law of the eternal Heptaparaparshanak, the law of seven. In ancient times, a device called Iadapan was built, which gave the 49 notes of the universe, seven multiplied by seven, and as a result of that, the Nereonosian sound of the universe, the note synthesis of the earth, arose. Two ancient sages, twin brothers, went to the Gobi Desert to always listen to the keynote of the universe. Whoever learns to handle that keynote can leave the physical body at will. Whoever learns to handle that keynote can do wonders and prodigies. Today's music has nothing to do with the keynote, nor with the sacred law of the eternal Heptaparaparshanak. It is a music that only serves to unleash animal passions. That music is typical of a root race that is degenerated. Any other questions? Student, can't the lifespan be extended, improving the food, for example? Samuel Aoun Weir, well, many trials have been carried out, and yet, look, Eisenhower died surrounded by doctors with marvelous diets. Stalin died surrounded by groups of scientists, so what? I have known extraordinary vegetarians who have gradually died of weakness. The best way to be able to extend life is by awakening awareness. If one awakens his consciousness, one can negotiate with the lords of karma and live enough years, the necessary ones to be able to afford the luxury of manufacturing the superior existential bodies of the being. Now, Whoever truly achieves self-realization can obviously, for this reason, receive the elixir of long life, which allows them to live on the face of the earth for millions of years. Count Cagliostro acted, during the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, in Europe, and still in 1939 he returned to Europe and will return in 1999, he is alive. Cagliostro, who some believe died in a prison, and others that he died in a duel with a swordsman, are mistaken, he is alive. Everyone who truly achieves self-realization can live for millions of years. Only by self-actualizing can one extend life. Is there any other question? Speak up, brother! Student, when you say, go out in the astral body, is it to be understood that one has a lunar astral body and that with this vehicle one can travel through the supersensible regions? Samuel Aoun Weir, only a human has bodies, the intellectual animal has no bodies. That he has a lunar astral body is not so. The intellectual animal, the only thing that he has inside are demons, it's a lot of devils, but it doesn't have more. When one says, go out in the astral body, one speaks in a conventional way. They are the eyes, 
which penetrate and interpenetrate each other. The essence goes there bottled and can escape and go out and travel and get to know the astral world to a certain point, not much, but to a certain point. What I said in one of my books about lunar bodies, I was referring to the egos and the three main demons that everyone carries inside, which are the demon of desire, the demon of the mind, and the demon of evil will, which they act as astral, mental, and causal, but they are nothing but demons. So, practically, the intellectual animal does not have any kind of bodies, neither solar, nor lunar, nor anything, it's a bunch of devils that you have to turn to dust, so that the consciousness remains free and can see, hear, touch or palpate the great realities of the universe. Are there any other questions? Student, how long, exactly, does the soul last or remain in a person's body after they die? Samuel Alan Weir, well, we have been told that fire sustains all of creation, but when the fire is withdrawn, creation ends. The fire, in us, is the essence, it is the soul, it is the consciousness, which is embedded in the ego. When that essence withdraws, the body dies, but when it definitively withdraws, because it can withdraw to travel, as it does during sleep. But, when it definitively withdraws, the body dies, it does not die before. And for the body to pass away, the angels of death have to cut the silver cord. When they cut it with the sickle, the body perishes. In such a way that, when the body is dead, the soul is not there either among the body, it is outside. Precisely, the body dies because the soul leaves, the soul is the essence or the consciousness. Is there any other question? Student, Master, Mr. Lobsang Rama speaks of the silver cord and he speaks of the gold cord. What do you say about that? Samuel Alan Weir, question of terms, because really, to speak of gold cord, that only the gods. Because the astral, mental, and causal bodies in the gods are bodies of gold, of the purest gold, of the best quality gold, of gold such that not even the richest minds on earth can produce it. Bodies of that kind have a gold cord, thus, to have a gold cord? That's for the gods. Common people have a lunar cord, the silver cord, that's all. Any other questions? Ask everyone, I don't want anyone to be left with doubts. I want all doubts to be removed here once and for all. Let's see, sister. Student, I worry about how to reach people when people don't want to listen. Samuel Alan Weir, well, no one can be taught by force, not even taken to heaven. As they also say, not even shoes fit by force. The one who does not want to listen, well, let him not listen, we cannot force them to listen. We, at most, can give him the teaching, but if he does not want to receive it, then not even the shoes fit by force. One complies with giving the teaching, if they did not accept it, sayonara, adieu, see you later. Any other question? Let's see, sister, speak. Student, master, could you tell us a little more about that instrument that played the 49 notes of the universe? Samuel Alan Weir, the Iadapan is an instrument invented by two initiated brothers, twins, in ancient China. They discovered that the universe had 49 notes and they made a beautiful instrument. Their many elements came into activity. Currently, all music devices are nothing but degenerations or devolutions of the iatapan. They did experiments like the following, making this instrument vibrate that gave 49 notes. Well, they acted on many things. They began to act on an octave, for example, from do to C, they passed, for example, a colored ray from the solar prism through the musical notes and it changed color. They learned how to capture the solar prism. Today's people the only thing they know is the prism, but they know it in its negative aspect. 
Those wise men knew how to get the positive from the solar prism and used the seven fundamental colors to do many experiments. Among those, for example, a certain color of the prism in its positive form was passed over a piece of bamboo and the piece of bamboo was immediately dyed with some color. The color blue in its positive form was passed over the opium, so to speak, and the opium immediately changed its chemical characteristics. The notes of the musical scale were combined with the colors of the prism in their positive form and those colors changed according to the musical scale. Thus, then, the colors and also the sacred law of the Heptaparaparshanak are combined, sounds and colors are combined. Today's people do not know the prism in its positive aspect, they know it only in its negative aspect. If they knew the prism in its positive aspect, they would do wonders with the seven colors of the solar prism. And if they learned to handle the 49 notes, they would become masters of the universe. Those 49 notes were given by the Iadapan, and those 49 notes and the synthesis of those 49 notes is the Nereonosian sound. That Nereonosian sound is the synthesis note of the earth, it vibrates here in the cerebellum of each one of you. If you go to bed at night, quietly, if you suspend your thoughts, if your mind remains still and silent and you intend to listen to what happens inside your cerebellum, you will feel a very subtle sound, which is like the sound of the grasshopper, of the cricket. That little sound is the Nereonosian sound. If you learn to listen to it, you can also learn to turn up the volume at will, and when you learn to turn it up, then the doors of perceptions will be open. If you manage to raise the volume of that sound, and then, when it is resonating, you get up from your bed, you will be able to do it with extraordinary ease and you will be able to travel, thus, out of the body, to the most remote places on earth the essence of you will be able to make your trip. Those who have an astral body will be able to travel with their astral body. Those who have not yet manufactured it will travel with the essence. The essence will allow you to contact all corners of the universe. But you have to manage that keynote. There is only one instrument that gives those 49 notes. The piano, the violin, the harp, are nothing but degenerations of that great instrument that those two brothers, initiates of ancient China, managed to create. I knew those mysteries, my dear brothers and sisters, the mysteries of the Order of the Yellow Dragon. I had an existence in China, or several existences, but in one of those many, in which I was called Choli and in which I belonged to the Cho dynasty, I learned about the mysteries of music and color, and I learned about the seven jewels of the yellow dragon. I have been ordered by the Logos to teach, to those who are emerging, to the comprehensive ones, that ancient doctrine by which one could unbottle the essence, at will, to experience the truth. Are there any other questions? Student, Master, does the soul evolve the same with the body of a man as with the body of a woman? Samalan Weir, well, I am going to tell you a great truth, that matter about evolution is out of order. I'm going to tell you why. Because in ancient times, people were not bottled up in the dogma of evolution. In ancient times, people knew about the law of the pendulum. They knew that one end of the pendulum lifted Egypt and the other end of the pendulum lifted the Jews. When the pendulum turned again to the other end, the Greek civilization arose. When it changed again and passed to the other extreme, it raised the Arab civilization. When it returned to the other end, the civilization of the Goths arose, etc. So, life is processed according to the law of the pendulum, everything moves according to that law, even our feelings, the heart. People, for example, who are triumphant, victorious, who believe that they are going to get a lot of money and that they will progress rapidly, they find that, overnight, they are in poverty, in ruins. When? 
When the pendulum changes place, when it passes from one extreme to the other, the materialistic unbelievers, enemies of the Eternal One, who made so much noise there, in Russia, are now changing because the pendulum is changing position, it is going to the other extreme, and spirituality is beginning to emerge in Russia. The greatest production, currently, by statistics, in matters of parapsychology, is coming from the Soviet Union, so, it is entering the psyche. At this moment, the Soviets have just discovered the vital body, with lenses and special electrical devices, and are studying it. They already baptized it with the name of bioplastic body, but they do not give their arm to twist, thus, they do not call it linga sarira or vital body, they gave it the name of bioplastic body. Thus, tomorrow's Russia can be terribly fanatical, religious, and vice versa, people today too spiritualistic, tomorrow they will be materialistic. Everything is moving according to the law of the pendulum, evolution, then, has no raison d'etre. However, we do not deny its existence. There is evolution in the germ that develops and grows, in the tree that ascends and finally produces branches and fruits. And there is devolution in the tree whose leaves are falling and whose branches are drying, until finally it becomes, then, a corpse. There is evolution in the creature that is gestating in the maternal womb, in the young that it is developing, but there is devolution in the decrepit old man that finally dies. Those are two purely physical, mechanical laws. The interesting thing, for us, is to get out of these two laws and get into the path of the revolution of the consciousness. In Tenth Arcanum, everything is written. On the right side of the Tenth Arcanum, the wheel of the tarot, we see Anubis evolving, rising, attached to the wheel, and on the left side Typhon descending, devolving. But beyond, above the wheel, appears the Sphinx, representing the sacred mysteries. That is the path, the path of the revolution of the consciousness. The head of the Sphinx is crowned with a crown of nine steel points, which represents the ninth sphere. It means that in the mysteries of sex there is the regeneration of the human being, there is our redemption, there is our revolution. The path of the Sphinx has nothing to do with the ascent nor with the descent of the wheel. It departs from the wheel, it goes away from the wheel. It is the narrow, straight and difficult path that Christ taught us. That is why the great teacher said, Narrow is the door and narrow is the path that leads to the light and very few are those who find it. Thus, the Gnostics do not walk along the path of evolution, nor do we want anything with devolution. We get into the path of the revolution in progress, of psychological rebellion, by the path of the revolution of the consciousness, by the straight, narrow and difficult path that the Divine Rabbi of Galilee, our Lord, the Christ, showed us. Thus, it is not through evolution that the soul, that the consciousness can reach an intimate self-development. That the consciousness needs a body? Indeed, it needs it, to be able to work, to be able to get to know yourself, that's why we're here. Outside the body, the soul receives information, and that information is necessary to continue on the path with full success. Therefore, learning to leave the physical body is essential. In my book entitled The Secret Doctrine of Anahuac, I have written at the end a series of chapters on dream yoga with a careful, meticulous didactics which will allow each one of you to function, consciously, in the astral world. But it seems that the Gnostic brothers and sisters have not studied those final chapters of The Secret Doctrine of Anahuac. In that book is all the technique to follow, a new technique, a technique that you do not know and that will serve you, even in the most difficult moments, as a system to reach awakening. But you have to follow that technique, which is in the last six chapters of The Secret Doctrine of Anahuac. Outside the body, 
the information that is needed can be received, but here, in the flesh, you have to work very hard to discover yourself. If some brother or sister want to ask, they can do so freely. I do not want you to carry doubts. It is better that once and for all you digest here everything you have. Student, master, in order to protect oneself. Samalown Weir, to protect oneself from what? Student, of the negative forces, of the eyes of others, that disturb us. Samalown Weir, well, I'm going to tell you that each one of us carries, inside, a veritable swarm of demons. Why worry so much about others, when inside we have a whole den of demons? Not worth it. The best thing is that we work on ourselves. Student, master, in terms of food, how should one eat? I understand that when food is ingested, it is processed with the seven musical notes, do, re, mi, fe, sol, la, si. Samalan Weir, I am going to tell you one thing, it is true, when one eats, the seven musical notes resound, but they resound naturally, and are resounding at all times, according to the law of the eternal Heptaparaparshanach. Of course, when one is chewing food, the hardest part is there and the dew resonates, and it resonates because it has to resonate. So, when food at its hardest stage is being chewed, the striking note Dio comes out. Passing through the larynx, because of all that matter has to pass through the larynx, then the striking note Ari resounds. When descending, when falling to the region of the stomach, the note in my strikes, but when the food enters into the process of the liver and spleen the note F.A. of creation resounds in all of that matter. The note S.O.L. is reached with the activity of the pancreas and the colon, the note L.A. when the vital principles are already entering the bloodstream, the highest note is the musical S.I., when that wonderful elixir of life reaches the sexual endocrine glands, then, the exioheri, the sacred sperm, the brute azoth, as they say in alchemy, is already elaborated. So, don't worry about the seven notes, don't think about it, there they resonate. You eat calmly and that's it. Let's see, does anyone else have something to ask? Student, is there something wrong about we, women, that we dress up, making ourselves, let's say, beautiful? Sam Malone Weir, well, I am going to tell you a great truth. The good, the true, the beautiful, must be related. There is nothing wrong with personal grooming in women. There is absolutely nothing wrong with it. The whole thing is in the attitude that one assumes. If a woman, for example, at the moment when she is getting ready, is conceited inside of her well-known beauty, naturally, she has fallen into the crime of vanity. But if she only grooms herself out of decorum, she grooms herself out of respect for her neighbor, she grooms herself so as not to walk in horrible, disheveledness down the street, well, she is doing nothing wrong. It all depends on the psychological attitude. In any case, the beautiful, the true and the good must be related. The feminine arrangement should never be condemnable. One has the right to get ready, to dress well. Because what would we say about a man with dirty shoes, a man with a suit all torn, dirty? Well, being poor is not a crime, but being unkempt is very serious. One can be poor, but not sleazy. The shirt must be clean, it must have socks that do not smell ugly. So, then, personal grooming does not harm anyone. Furthermore, one must fix oneself personally, not so much for oneself, but out of respect for one's neighbor. I could present myself here disheveled, in any case, but I come half fixed. Because? Out of respect for you. If I came here in shirt sleeves, all dirty, like the man who just got out of bed, what would we say about that? That I would not be respecting you, 
I would be disrespecting you. So, we all need to dress up out of respect for our neighbor. Are there any other questions? Student, master, what does the ninth sphere represent? Samalown Weir, the ninth sphere represents sex. Nine months we remain inside the maternal womb, nine ages humanity acts within the bosom of Ray, Sibylle, nature. Thus, the ninth sphere is sex. Student, the work in the ninth sphere, is it a ritual that we must practice? Samalown Weir, we all live the ritual of the ninth sphere, yes. Creatures are born from there, man is born from the ninth sphere. The world is born, where is the world born from? Isn't the world born from the ninth sphere? Now, the practical ritual, the work with the creative energy, is in the ninth sphere. The earth has nine strata, in the ninth layer of the earth, there is the sign of infinity, which is an eight placed horizontally, brain, heart, and sex. The fight is terrible, brain against sex, sex against brain. But if sex defeats the brain, then the initiate falls, like the five-pointed star, with the upper angle downwards and the two lower rays upwards, it is Arcanum 16 of Tarot and Kabbalah, failure. Thus, in the ninth sphere is where the forces of sex are. The sign of the eight, placed in the center of the earth, is also in our organism. We are all organized according to the brain, heart, and sex. Behold the eight, the symbol of infinity, the ninth sphere. The work in the ninth sphere is the work in the forge of the cyclops. In the ninth sphere we are transmuting our creative energy and we must transmute that energy to regenerate ourselves, to transform ourselves, to create the superior existential bodies of the being. Student, are the laws that govern the fourth coordinate the same as those of this third dimension? Samalown Weir, the laws are different because in the fourth vertical you can float with a body of flesh and blood and everything, in the fourth vertical the laws are different. Student, master, I understand that here in Chapultepec there is a temple in Jin State. Can you pass anyone with a physical body to that temple? Samalown Weir, yes, I can, but someone cannot go to the temple of Chapultepec without being duly authorized. To be authorized, you have to deserve it. It is a temple of the fourth vertical. Now, getting one inside the fourth vertical is not that difficult. With a little practice, you can do it. All you need is a little faith. One lies down in his bed on the left side, puts his head on the palm of his left hand, then invokes, for example, Harpocrates, he has to invoke it with his mantra Harpocrates and then wait a bit, when lying on one side, it should lie in the form of a chick inside a shell, inside an egg, on the bureau or night table next to the bed, you have to put precisely a chicken egg shell, painted blue, imagine one that is inside that egg. Invoke Harpocrates, when you start to feel an itch on your body, you shouldn't move, there is a tendency to scratch, but you shouldn't scratch. If you begin to see that your hands, legs, and body are swelling, it is because you are already entering the fourth vertical. When it looks like it's swollen, get out of bed, really stand up to walk towards the door saying, Harpocrates help me because I'm going with my body. Before leaving the chamber, one jumps with the intention of perforating the fourth vertical. If it floats, it is because it is ready, it can leave the house and head with a body of flesh and blood through the fourth vertical to wherever you want to go, no problem, nothing happens to you. Student, and to return? Samalown Weir, well, there is a law in the fourth vertical that says, everything returns to its original starting point. In the fourth vertical, this law is fully fulfilled, one returns to its original starting point. I, for example, did many experiments in my present existence to learn how to travel with the physical body through the fourth vertical. I am going to tell you an anecdote. 
Do you know what it's like to get out of my room after being warm under the blankets and go out into the patio of the house, and it's even raining? In addition, one can get pneumonia and without being able to achieve anything, but in one of those many exits, I went out and jumped and remained floating, in the fourth vertical I saw myself floating and already in the fourth vertical I was able to go perfectly where I wanted. Another time I began to call some jinn people to come help me, all holy night lying on one side, calling those people from jinn states to come, finally there at two or three in the morning I felt in a very special state, someone touches my arm, I look again, a lady is there and tells me, okay, get up. Since I am a man of faith, I got up from my bed, I stood up, then I see that in the shade, near a little table that was there in the corner, there were other ladies around the table, they had the tarot there and through the tarot they had consulted about who was going to bear the responsibility of taking me to Europe. Luck fell to the one who called me, that's why she called me, then she told me, well, it's my turn to take him. Then I saw with astonishment that she took me as if to help me support myself, so I walked, crossed a patio, grabbed a long passage, opened the door, went out into the street, when opening the door, it was not the door that was opened, but the counterpart. Great was my astonishment when I came out and found that many other people, men and women, live in the fourth vertical with a body of flesh and blood. Well, I started walking those streets. It was a great joy for me. It was one of my first trips with a body of flesh and blood in the fourth dimension. It gave me such great joy that I decided to get up afloat and then dive, like a plane, right? I had to stop those antics when the lady called me to order. She told me, Sir, I have a great moral responsibility with you. If you continue with that, you are going to kill yourself, you can kill yourself, remember that you are carrying the body, even if you are here in the fourth dimension, you can kill yourself if you continue as you are, so, do me a favor, stay calm. Then I continued traveling with her. In an apartment in the astral world another gentleman was waiting, he was also learning to travel in the fourth dimension. We arrived, we greeted him, that lady introduced him to me, and then, she took not only me, but him as well, and said, come on, let's cross the ocean. I crossed the ocean at this time of night, I crossed the Atlantic Ocean. For a moment I felt insecure, an idea came to me, what if we left the fourth vertical right now and here in the middle of the ocean? If we were to lose that gin state, how would we be? No one would be left alive there. Well, we kept traveling until we reached a beach in Europe. At that time there was the Second World War. We passed through some European lands where they were in the Second World War, then that friend told me, here we have to go very carefully because we are inside the fourth dimension, we do not carry documents of any kind, if unfortunately we were to lose the Jin state here, we will fall here in these lands and we are in the second world war, here we lose our lives, we have to be very careful. Well, we really had to be very careful because there are steel spikes, metallic objects and it's very dangerous. So, we continued until that lady entered another house in Europe where she was waiting for another person, so we stayed there talking a bit and he told me, I don't know what I see inside you, but in you there is a bit of science, a bit of philosophy and a lot of magic, that's what you have inside. We waited for the lady who was looking for another person who studied philosophy, we waited patiently for her to take her out of it, then she also left, and we continued the trip, we went where we had to go in parts of old Europe, I got where I had to go. After having been where I had to be, then I returned home, I arrived and lay down on my bed, and everything was perfect, the trip was wonderful. When one finds it difficult to enter the jinn states, one does the practices and does not achieve it and one wants to achieve it, I am going to tell you, one concentrates on the seven potencies, I am not referring to the seven zodiacal genii, no, 
but to a group of masters who are called the Seven Potencies, with the mantra, Murizurinka, 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 that's how you have to sing it. Let the seven potencies come, and one begs them with his serene heart and begs them to prepare. The body, then the seven potencies prepare it for you. This work must be done every night and followed for at least a year. After one considers that his body is ready, then one begins to work again with the jinn states until one achieves it. The work with Harpocrates seems wonderful to me because it turns out that Harpocrates handles a variant of the Christic forces, he handles the jinn states, wherever there is a jinn temple, there is the Harpocratian force, wherever there is a person who enters the jinn states, there is the Harpocratian force, but you have to know how to pronounce the mantra, the name of Harpocrates is Harpocrates, but the mantra is Harpocrates, and then one concentrates. It is convenient to bathe with aromatic herbs when doing the work with the seven potencies, that helps a lot, among these are mint, orange, chamomile, etc., aromatic plants, one chooses plants that have aroma and helps to prepare the body. Student, I read in a book that during the Second World War they experimented with wave devices to try to make a kind of weapon with which to disintegrate the physical matter of humans. Samuel Aun Weir, that nonsense is not possible, with no physical wave can anyone disintegrate physical matter. Each physical body has a double, I would classify that double as antimatter, because just as matter exists, antimatter exists, just as the atom exists, the antiatom exists, just as there are electrons, there are anti-electrons. Twice one would be antimatter with electrical charges in reverse, antimatter is proven to exist and has reverse electrical charges. Student, Master, what can you tell us about Lobsang Rampa? Samalan Weir, Lobsang Rampa is an initiate, a master. His mission has consisted specifically of doing popular work, playing the first clarion call inciting people so that each one of them comes to look for his path, that has been the work of the master Lobsang Rampa, and many have come to Gnosis thanks to the work of that master. I really long for innocence for each one of you, I would like to see the essence of each one of you unbottled, free, I would like to see you in Eden, I would like to see you among the wonders of the cosmos, when the essence is unbottled, how happy we are. Let's observe the elementals of nature, how happy! They live in the paradise realms. Let us observe the princes of fire, air, water and earth, they open their marvelous doors before us when we reconquer innocence. It is necessary that the mind be pure, that the heart be simple and that we have a healthy body, it is urgent that the pure spirit truly shine in us. When we return to the paradisiacal state, we will listen to all those miracles of fire, all those symphonies that always resonate with the rhythms of the Mahavan and the Shotavan that hold the universe steady in its march. When we return to the paradisiacal state for having reconquered innocence, we will know what the unity of life free in its movement is, and we will truly feel in our hearts the palpitations of the most distant star and the humblest flower. When we have reconquered innocence, the torrent that rushes through its bed of rocks and the pale moon that shines in the blue sky of the starry night will have miraculous words for us. When we have reconquered innocence, we will be able to speak in the purest ortho of the divine language that runs like a river of gold through the thick, sunny jungle. When we have reconquered innocence, we will once again play like children with the fairies of fire, air, water and earth, then, my dear brothers and sisters, we will be happy. Today we are in pain, we suffer the unspeakable because we have not yet reconquered our innocence, our mind is loaded with the dust of countless centuries, we are lepers, we need Christ the Redeemer to cleanse us of this leprosy. Obviously, such leprosy is nothing more than the I, the ego, the myself, the self-willed. 
We need to be clean as the patriarch job was after having suffered so much. When we regain innocence, my dear brothers and sisters, we will be in communion with the holy gods, then we will know that they really exist. When we regain innocence, we will be able to talk with Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. When we regain innocence, our father Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great god Ibis of Thoth, will come to instruct us. When we regain innocence, we will then be able to have an intimate dialogue with our divine cosmic mother and she will lull us to sleep with her best songs. She, in her arms, will caress us will rock us again in the cradle of nature with the lullaby with which a mother lulls the tender son that she carries in her arms. When we have regained innocence, my dear brothers and sisters, we will be able to see the lion of the law face to face and then we will understand that fire can radically transform us. When we have regained innocence, we will understand that those twenty-four elders of the Apocalypse of St. John are within ourselves here and now, they are the twenty-four parts of our being. When we have reconquered innocence, we will see that the four blessed ones, the four holy creatures that direct the fire, that govern the air, the water and the earth, are also part of our own being. When we have reconquered innocence, we will throw our crowns at the feet of the Lamb, then we will know what is truly the internal Christ, what is truly the immolated Lamb, the Redeemer. The time has come, my dear brothers and sisters, to dissolve everything that makes us ugly, to put an end to that dust of centuries that we carry inside us. The Lamb washes us with His redeeming blood, that blood is fire. Let us love the Lamb, let us worship Him because He is certainly the Savior. Who could sacrifice for us? Who better than the Lamb? He, within ourselves, taking charge of our mental, volitional, sentimental, emotional, sexual processes, He, within ourselves, eliminating everything we have that is horrifying, finally saves us, that is why He is our Savior. Let us worship the Lamb and throw ourselves at His feet, because He is worthy of all honor and glory and majesty. He will allow us to return to the most pure innocence of ancient times. He will allow us to re-experience in our hearts the melodies that escape from the lyre of Orpheus. He will allow us to feel again in our consciousness the scintillation of the planets of our Lord the Christ. He will then allow us to return regenerated to ancient Arcadia, where the rivers of pure water of life flowed with milk and honey, up there in the starry skies the sons of the spirit beat, down here on the banks of the singing rivers, the flowers of the soul shine. It is necessary that the spirit and the soul in perfect matrimony live together for our good. It is necessary for the brute stone and the diamond to be integrally fused so that they become spiritual sons. It is necessary to eat of the fruits of the tree of life. It is necessary to throw ourselves, my dear brothers and sisters, to throw ourselves at the feet of our Lord, the intimate Christ, and adore him eternally. Inverential Peace